So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to get going on this. It's uh, 12.01 now. Um, my name is Dennis Keen. I work here at Brexit. I'm a vice president Been in the business for about 20, 25 years now at this point. Um, I'll be doing a lot of the moderation for the webinar. Uh, Laurel Crawford, who is our lab manager, been in the business for a similar amount of time, will be doing the bulk of the presentation. Um, and we'll go from there. So uh, just a couple of housekeeping issues really quickly. The webinar we have and we're included with it, we will basically send it out via email uh, so that you can download either a copy of the slide deck or also a video of the actual presentation. So you'll have that information. And then um, so what I, if you guys could let me know and then uh, the other item is we have a chat icon associated with the. Um, we have the chat icon associated with the. Uh, on the top hand right right slide or top right of the teams. You can use that to ask questions or if you have a microphone, uh, you can basically hit the little raise hand icon with the smiley face, which is also towards the top right and then also send that over. Um, so we're going to get started here in a moment and uh, just give us one second here and we'll be good to go. I couldn't hear you. So um, don't worry about it, just keep okay. going. Okay, sorry. Going. Okay, on with the show. And if there's any questions, obviously you just use the chat function uh, also up there on the top right hand side and we should be able to go from there. So this uh, webinar is on treatability testing for remedial applications. Uh, Laurel Crawford will be giving most of the uh, presentation here. I'll we'll move on here. So the big question we like to ask folks or ask ourselves is why should people listen to us at all? Uh, what's what's you know, why does XDD have anything to say on these subjects at all? So XDD uh, as a company has been around since 1997. We have um, been involved in the implementation of remedial solutions since the early 1980s. Our principals, Mike Marley specifically, was involved in some of the first silver extraction air sparging systems put in in the mid 80s or so, along with um, some of the first applications of institute chemical oxidation, uh, specifically alkaline activated persulfate, and a few other of the te chemical technologies out there. Additionally, we implement and analyze and design essentially a number of remedial technologies bioremediation, thermal enhanced remediation, and uh, vapor intrusion. Uh, one of the big things we provide for our end users, consultants, and contractors is treatability testing, almost always with an eye towards the end goals of the site. Laurel, can you advance to the next slide, please? I don't think Laurel can hear me. Hold up just one second. I apologize. I still can't. I don't I don't know what you're talking about. So, right, so then one more slide. Chat, and you'll see me chat here essentially. Say next. Uh, Your their mic is muted though. Okay. I apologize for that. Some technical difficulties on our end. Um, 
So integrated remedial strategies here. Uh, the big thing for us is there's kind of this five part series where we define objectives, define the criteria associated with the site. We go through an RI remedial investigation, which commonly can have several phases, potentially depending on the size and complexity of your site. And then the focus of this uh, work will be, or this webinar will be the feasibility and treatability study component. And that's where we really want to basically look and evaluate different remedial designs associated with uh, the solution and what the end objective is. And really what we want to make sure is we're looking at for the feasibility and treatability study is the end objective. What is going the application going to look like in the field? What is the ultimate goal for that remedial application? Uh, and what does the client really want to get out of it? So it's often very easy to get stuck in a loop where you're looking at the other four items without really kind of looking at what the end goal is. No. All right, Laurel, you're all set. You can go. OK. Um, yeah, sorry, I had trouble hearing Dennis for some reason. Um, but I will be presenting the rest of this presentation. Um, so if, let me know if you have um, any questions that uh, that you're going to shoot over um, in the uh, chat area. So why conduct treatability studies? Treatability studies can aid in the selection of the appropriate technology for your site. For example, for ISCO, selecting the appropriate oxidant and right dosage is critical to meet the contaminant demand as well as non-target demand. Um, non-target demand can include organics and reduced metals. We find in most cases that the non-target demand is much greater. And ISCO benches can identify failure mechanisms. Um, so we can determine adverse re reactions between the oxidant and the soil and groundwater. Uh, for example, the photo on the left shows um, adverse reaction between permanganate and soil and groundwater. In this case, the soil uh, was it contained a lot of organics and peat, so it reacted vigorously with the oxidant. Other adverse reactions can include gas and heat produced from peroxide, for example. On the right hand side shows gas emanating from a batch reactor with peroxide in contact with site media. I'm going to try to play the, the video here. Um, hopefully that's showing up, but it's um, showing the gas coming out. Um, so pretty, pretty significant. And for biotechnologies, treatabilities can help determine um, design parameters, such as if there are food and nutrients that might need to be supplemented at your site, and are the appropriate bacteria present in sufficient numbers, um, or is bio-augmentation needed? Also, is a ge geochemistry favorable for biodegradation, such as a neutral pH, um, which is where bacteria thrive best in this neutral pH range? Um, also, is there something toxic like high metals or chloride that could inhibit biodegradation? And bench testing can help determine secondary effects such as metals mobilization, unwanted byproducts due to a change in geochemistry from the amendments you're adding. And keeping the current and future use of the site in mind, these logistics are um, important. For example, if the full scale application is going to take place underneath a building, oxidants that produce gas would be an issue. Also, certain oxidants would have compatibility issues with underground utilities. And if the site is going to be redeveloped it, with new building structures, you also need to take into account the potential for reduced stability and strength of the soils in the subsurface after an application. Treatability tests can determine the best technology for your site, and the results can be used to scale up to the field design and treatability tests has a low cost compared to a full-scale application and 
will save on costs in the long run by determining your appropriate design parameters. So in a nutshell, uh, picture is worth a thousand words. Um, cost savings, you're determining the correct amount of reagents applied in the field through a bench test. So underdosing is avoided, which can often result in apparent failure and additional mobilization events. And on the flip side of the coin, bench and pilot tests can help avoid overdosing. XCD has a comprehensive list of capabilities, including ISCO, activated persulfate, includes iron and alkaline activated, but in some cases unactivated persulfate may be sufficient, which is cheaper to apply. Solid phase oxidants, for example, potassium persulfate, which has a low solubility with the advantage of a slow release source of persulfate, appropriate for like a barrier application. Uh, potassium and sodium permanganate and zero valent iron um, under uh, chemical reduction technologies, zero valent iron, including bimetallic amendments such as nickel catalyzed ZVI, um, ZVI with a biosimulation component such as emulsified ZVI, which has a food source component to stimulate both abiotic and biotic processes. Metal sulfides like calcium polysulfide, mixed reagents such as EHC. In situ stabilization can be used for several contaminants such as metals, VOCs, SVOCs. Um, that's pesticides for a recent bench study we're looking at. And surfactant enhanced product recovery can be used in combination with ISCO. For bioremediation, um, if your site requires biostimulation, bioaugmentation, bio studies in the lab are helpful. Depending on the contaminants present, it might be an aerobic or an anaerobic study or even a sequential anaerobic followed by aerobic bench test. For example, di and trichlorobenzenes typically degrade anaerobically to chlorobenzene, which degrades aerobically. However, the di and trichlorobenzenes can degrade aerobically, but it's um, just not as common. Technologies that might not come to mind, but can be also tested at the bench scale include thermal enhancements. We'll um, show a couple of case studies of those later on. And then finally, combined technologies. We've tested ISS with ISCO, also using uh, cement in combination with organic clay and carbon. We had a recent bench where the client was going to use uh, surfactant to control odors at the site during the application. Due to the unknown of how the surfactant might affect the curing properties of the cement or the demand for the carbon, we incorporated that into the testing as well. So it's very important to think about these aspects to try to match the bench as closely as possible to uh, the field application. And treatment trains. Um, we've conducted a lot of bench tests for coal ash pond sites recently where we have a complex suite of metals requiring an initial aeration and a pH adjustment step followed by filtration and resin treatment. So later on we will provide case studies for several of these technologies. The treatability lab capabilities also include uh, measurements of geochemical parameters such as pH and ORP monitoring, oxidants uh, measurements using a standard titration procedure. We also uh, measure for volatile organic compounds and dissolved gases using a headspace method by gas chromatography. 
However, XCD is not a certified analytical laboratory. Samples are sent to a certified laboratory for analysis if required, um, and that's project specific. But using the in-house analyses as a screening tool with the benefit of obtaining real-time data can be very beneficial to our treatability testing. For example, when we conduct biotreatability tests, we can use VOC data to determine the rate at which the contaminants are degrading and then adjust our test duration or intermediate time points if needed. Likewise, we use dissolved gas data as a secondary line of evidence that biodegradation is occurring. For aerobic studies, the oxygen data is used to determine if we need to add more oxygen to the microcosms to maintain aerobic degradation. Um, we, we have sites where we've tested um, international soils. We have the um, USDA permit to do that. Um, we've conducted research funded testing, such as um, metals and mobilization during ISCO through CERTIP, um, PFAS study, which will show as a case study later on. Um, and lastly, we customize our testing based on site specific project goals and budget. We conduct treatability testing for end users, consultants, and contractors. Therefore, we can test various products and amendments independently for an even comparison. So the state of the practice versus state of the art. What commonly happens during a remedial investigation is that the design steps are skipped in order to save costs. So uh, this state of the practice is ultimately you end up with a higher cost overall because the design parameters haven't been determined in these um, tree um, in these pretreatment steps. Whereas if you do these design steps, it might be a higher cost initially, but it gets you the appropriate parameters to design at the full scale, giving you a higher certainty of success and ultimately cost savings. So common state of the practice, again, remedial design steps, um, treatabilities, pilot testing, um, they can be skipped to um, uh, try to move the remedial investigation forward. But the treatability and pilot testing is important to help determine your site specific design parameters such as TOD, total oxidant demand, confirm dosing, identify interferences, um, site geology and hydrogeology. Site geology, hydrogeology, and heterogeneity and COCs geology can be kept in mind and incorporated into the treatability studies and pilot tests. For example, if you need to test uh, more than one area, if you have heterogeneous soils in terms of geology and contaminant concentrations. And oftentimes we um, use dosing spreadsheets for remedial designs, which might be provided by vendors, but usually they um, only give you a minimum dosing requirement. It's, it's a good starting point though, but uh, it requires additional evaluation that's often not conducted. So related to this, um, the first case study dealt with three um, oxygen release products that were tested at a Superfund site. Consisted of uh, chlorinated solvents and petroleum hydrocarbons in uh, multiple sources. Out of the three products tested at the bench scale, um, the one that had the highest recommended dosage, that dosage was applied for all three products. And the remedial goal was to get a greater than 90% um, reduction in contamination. 
the results showed that after the first dose of the pro of each product, um, less than 20% reduction in contaminants was achieved. Uh, therefore, we applied a second dose of the same dose, um, same concentrations of amendment, and then a third dose. And even after three doses, all three products um, failed to, to meet the 90% reduction. So the takeaway here is just that conducting treatability studies and pilot studies is important to um, you know, verifying any dosages that might be recommended. So a little more about the details of what goes into a treatability test. Controls are set up in the same manner and carried through the same procedures as the treated conditions. Um, Biocontrols can consist of a killed control, um, killing any bacteria that might be present, uh, unamended control, so um, no addition of nutrients um, or electron donor food source, but seeing if there perhaps is native bacteria present. For ISCO, our controls consist of the site media only, so no oxidant. And uh, duplicate or triplicate reactors are often set up for experimental and analytical precision, um, but depending on the client's budget, level of certainty needed, um, th these might be several or or just um, you know maybe a couple of test conditions are set up in duplicate. Test durations can vary. Typically, ISCO, ISCR, ISS on the order from a couple of days to um, eight weeks. Um, bio can last uh, much longer depending on whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. Aerobic is uh, um, typically faster kinetics, shorter test duration. Um, anaerobic rates can be longer, but again, these degradation rates are very site specific. Media requirements can vary widely depending on the scope and technology. We typically require more for um, a test that is set up for several conditions, um, treatments, more than one soil type. Um, we'd also need more media for a, a column study. And most importantly, collecting samples from an, your area that's going to be treated. Um, so you want samples that are representative of the treatment area. Are they contaminated enough? Is there more than one source area with different contaminants or concentrations of contaminants that should be tested? Is there more than one geology type? So costs can range anywhere from a couple grand to 50 grand or more, depending again upon the function of the scope, technology, number of samples, budget, etc. We often use a phased approach in our uh, treatability tests. For example, screening multiple technologies for emerging contaminants and then perhaps refining one or two of those technologies for further testing. For ZBI and biotechnologies, uh, these often consist of an initial batch reactor setup to determine the correct amendments, dosages, um, approximate your kinetics to see if nutrient or bacteria would need to be added. And then this can be followed by column testing with the product that performed the best in the batch tests. You can refine the dosing during this phase of the testing. An example of batch reactors are shown at the bottom and a column test setup is shown up at the top right. ISCO testing is often conducted in two phases. Phase one consists of testing one or more op oxidants to determine your total oxidant demand, pH buffering, 
stability, which can help determine your failure mechanisms. The phase two is conducted based on the phase one results. So we might select the best oxidant and test one or two concentrations of that oxidant for an evaluation of the um, efficiency and contaminant destruction. Sometimes the client just wants the phase one, depending on the project needs. So we might just do uh, a TOD test. And testing to approximate your field conditions is important in bench tests. We've seen studies where 10 or 20 or more pore volumes of groundwater in contact with soil were tested, um, which is not representative of your in situ conditions. A low groundwater to soil ratio is ideal. Typically, one to two pore volumes is best. This becomes challenging though, when we need to conduct analyses that require a lot of volume, such as TPH and groundwater. So sometimes we look at seeing if providing less volume to the lab, thus requiring dilution and higher reporting limits, and maybe that will meet the project needs. So it's kind of a balancing act of how many pore volumes you add versus um, what's required for analytical. Groundwater temperature, we have conducted a lot of bench tests at specific temperatures to approximate site conditions. This is especially important for technologies in which temperature has a large influence on the kinetics, um, especially for bio. Also microcosm studies are typically stored in darkness um, for bio to mimic actual in situ conditions. And you want samples in their native condition. For example, when we conduct anaerobic biotreatability tests, samples are collected anaerobically with argon filled bottles to maintain the low DOP and ORP geochemical conditions to keep any bacteria that are present viable. So you want to evaluate your total mass treated. So we incorporate both the, bo both the soil and groundwater in our testing. Otherwise you can get inaccurate results. Um, in other words, a, a false positive greater treatment than you actually are getting. So you need to account for partitioning effects and these can be highly variable. Um, Depends on your KOC, your soil absorption coefficient is, is compound Pacific, and these literature values can vary widely. Um, your FOC can vary widely depending on the site soil. And what we've often observed in ISCO tests, um, for example, is that contaminants can be bound up in the soils and then they are released into the aqueous phase um, after you apply the oxidant. So again, getting that mass balance is important um, in analyzing both the soil and groundwater. So this case study involved a um, chlorobenzene contaminated, contaminated weathered bedrock and soil site the site was being over, the Army Corps was overseeing this, the site remediation. The Army Corps approached XDD to apply peroxide in the field. But we noticed a bench study was previously conducted by a different lab on thermally treated soils. So we were concerned it wouldn't be representative of the area uh, to be treated. So the Army Corps allowed us to test uh, CHP and persulfate to verify the feasibility. CHP worked well, but it had a short longevity. Um, activated persulfate was more stable. However, we were required to conduct side-by-side -side pilot tests to verify 
verify these bench test results. The pilot testing did confirm the CHP failure, and it also confirmed that persulfate was successful due to enhanced stability and contact. And the per persulfate being successful, uh, the takeaway here was that the thermally treated soils were not representative of the soils targeted for treatment. Persulfate was applied full scale and provided cost savings in the long run. The next case study is a landfill site with a suite of contaminants. There's an existing extraction system with powdered activated carbon followed by sand filtration for treatment. It's been operating for several years, but eventually uh, one for dioxane showed up as an emerging, emerging contaminant that is not treated by carbon. So an advanced oxidation process using peroxide and ozone was proposed and it has proven effective on 1,4-dioxane, so it was tested at the bench scale. The goal is to treat 1,4-dioxane to criteria, but maintain byproducts within a regulatory standard. So the complication is that common disinfection byproducts are formed during water treatment processes, such as um, peroxide with ozone. Bromate is a common disinfection byproduct, and bromide is present at high concentrations at the site, and as it's a precursor to bromate formation, meeting the MCL of 10 micrograms per liter for bromate was a concern. So the results of the study showed that the peroxide to ozone molar ratio needed to be optimized to reduce bromate. Um, we tested four different scenarios, uh, keeping the molar ratio of one with increasing ozone, 1,4-dioxine decreased. However, with increasing ozone, bromate increased. So in conclusion, the molar ratio required an optimization to reduce bromate formation while being able to meet the goals for 1,4-dioxine treatment. This next site involves a thermal enhanced SVE BV bench. The site was a former facility that manufactured enamels and insulated um, products, other resins for coatings and adhesives, which resulted in a suite of VOCs and SVOCs. The challenge was that the soils were heterogeneous, some lower permeability than others, varying in thickness and depth across the site. A grout and water treatment system was currently in place, but a treatability was set up to evaluate if thermally enhanced SVE bioventing was feasible and provide cost savings. It was set up as a column test. Three different soils were tested because of the heterogeneity and geology and contaminant levels. Three temperatures were tested, 35 degrees C, 50 and 70. And some of the columns were transitioned to a bioventing phase where oxygen flow rates were decreased. And we measured those oxygen rates um, to monitor the degradation rates. And some of the select um, test conditions received nutrients. The results of the bench testing indicated a majority of the treatment occurred during the bioventing phase. With total COC reductions and concentrations ranging from 
65, uh, greater than 76% to 99%. And as would be expected, higher oxygen utilization was noted in the more impacted columns. And this utilization decreased with time due to the contaminant food source becoming depleted. Samples were submitted for bacterial counts and the results indicated an increase in bacteria population. Nutrients um, had limited additional benefit for the select test conditions and the increased temperature accelerated the rate of contaminant reduction although the 50 and 70 degrees Celsius treatments showed limited additional benefit compared to the 35 degree Celsius scenario. So for the full scale design, the heterogeneity of the soils was incorporated into the design uh, through modeling and the treatability test results were incorporated into the design. After eight months of operation, the massive VOCs and SVOCs decreased by 58% and 73% respectively. And it was determined that 86% of that mass reduction was due to biodegradation which was validated through oxygen and chemical oxygen demand measurements. 12 months post-operation, 90% of the system was uh, allowed to be shut down. The next case study involved a phased ZVI treatability. It is a site that is a former landfill in which chlorinated VOCs are migrating in groundwater from the source area through weathered bedrock. The goal is to achieve an 80% reduction in total contaminants of concern. A PRB is a proposed remedy using ZVI, which is to be emplaced into blasted bedrock trenches such that the fines would aid in the distribution of the ZVI. The bench scale testing consists of two components. The first phase was a ZVI kinetics batch test. The batch test was conducted using three ZVI products from Hepure, Ferrex Flow, Ferrex Target, and Ferrex Plus Emulsified at two dosages for each product, one and 5%, with site groundwater in contact with crushed bedrock. The ZVI kinetics batch test was conducted to determine the optimal ZVI dosage to achieve the 80% reduction goal, as well as estimate the required treatment zone width and therefore column length for the column testing. The ZVI column testing conducted as part of the next phase used the product and dose that demonstrated the optimal results from the kinetics batch test. The objectives were to confirm the dose could meet the remedial goals and to provide a more accurate evaluation of the treatment zone width needed in the bedrock perpendicular to groundwater flow. The column testing scenarios included a four and eight foot treatment zone in which the column length was intended, intended to match the PRB width. A site groundwater flow rate of two feet per day was simulated. The photo shows the effluent being collected from the Ferrex flow and target columns which were tested on the right hand side. The control tested on the left hand side uh, received a initial fluorescent um, dye tracer, fluorescein. Um, it was used to verify that the pump setting would, would achieve our flow rate of two feet per day. So the results showed that Ferox 
Target in general outperform the other two ZVI products. EZVI did not meet the treatment goals in either the batch or, or column test conditions. The 5% Ferex flow achieved the 80% reduction goal by day 25 in the batch tests and by day 13 um, with Ferex target. The four and eight foot column treatment results resulted into up to 66% reduction using Ferox flow and 91% in um, the Ferox target columns. The bench testing concluded a minimum of four uh, feet PRB width would be required to treat the COCs in groundwater, assuming a two foot per day groundwater velocity. Due to possible heterogeneities that weren't simulated in the bench testing, a PRB wider than four feet and or a higher dosing of ZVI might be required. So a cost benefit analysis was recommended to evaluate a four foot PRB consisting of five foot uh, percent Ferrex target versus perhaps a wider PRB trench or higher dosage of Ferrex flow which has the advantage of having a lower cost per pound and a greater longevity. Lastly, it should be noted that um, products eliminated for um, application at a, at a site doesn't necessarily mean they won't work. It's just that they didn't work under the site, um, the specific conditions tested at the bench scale. There are really limitless scenarios you can test in a bench, but you can't evaluate them all. In the case of EZVI, it's not necessarily that it's ineffective, it just didn't meet the requirements for this site. And what happens with the EZVI and other oily-based amendments that we've tested is the contaminants can absorb to the oil phase initially, um, but eventually they are released for treatment um, into the aqueous phase. We've spoken to vendors about this phenomenon that can occur uh, that requires this initial acclimation period um, and thus an overall longer treatment duration. The next case study was funded and conducted in collaboration with GHD, Eurofins Test America, Alpha Analytical, and SGS Laboratories. It was also conducted in two phases, um, a batch reactor phase set up with granular, granular activated carbon and six other media, including controls. And for the water tested, it was mostly driven by PFOA concentrations. They were the highest components in the water. Um, but the, the results were very variable. If from the batch test results, the four products that performed the best were carried into the second phase of pre treatment, which was a column phase. So the four treatments included two um, media, a commercial resin, and um, GAC along with two controls, so six columns in total. And uh, the results showed that GAC and media number two outperformed the other treatments in terms of breakthrough. So this graph shows the total PFAS uh, versus the number of bed volumes. The um, media one, resin, um, they, they broke through fairly quickly after less than a thousand um, bed volumes, um, whereas media number two and GAC outperformed the other treatments. And the next to last case study involved a treatment train approach for a large industrial site. 
It had a surface cap with a pump and treat system. It had uh, high iron levels and um, TOC and COD levels that needed to be addressed among the other contaminants. A pretreatment process demonstrated success at the bench scale and it was subsequently implemented in the field for what, which XCD provided support. The pre-GAC treatment process consisted of coagulation, flocculation, and settling process for the iron, a pH adjustment, and TOC COD removal using absorbent. The pretreatment steps resulted in cost savings due to improved efficiency of the GAC. The last case study involved enhanced bio for a site contaminated with chlorinated solvents and fractured bedrock. Metals mobilization was a concern for the client. Pump and treat was installed for um, treating the hotspot area but bio was proposed to be evaluated as an alternate for potential cost savings. So the treatability testing determined the site lacked a food source, um, that nutrients and bacteria were limiting and needed to be added, and that the pH needed to be adjusted. Bacteria thrive best in a neutral pH range. So anything higher or lower than a neutral range is not ideal for bacteria to thrive. So the full-scale remedy involved a push-pull approach using the reagents and dosages and um, conditions determined from the treatability test. Two applications were conducted over a 12 month period. And as a result, the pump and treat system was shut down. So that concludes our uh, webinar. If there are any questions, we can, we have time for them now, or um, you can also email them uh, if you would like to have them answered later on. So thank you very much. All right, I don't think we have any questions. So again, uh, we'll provide the a copy of the presentation and also a recording of it in an email uh, later on for you. And again, uh, Laurel's contact information is right there. So if you would like to reach out to her uh, or even myself, uh, I sent some emails earlier on today. You can always do that. We'd be happy to answer them. Um, hope you have a good rest of your Wednesday. Thank you.